What if I told you Jesus came to abolish religion? What if I told you voting Republican really wasn't his mission? What if I told you Republican doesn't automatically mean Christian and just because you call some people blind doesn't automatically give you vision? I mean, if religion is so great, why has it started so many wars? Why does it build huge churches but fails to feed the poor? Tell single moms God doesn't love them if they've ever had a divorce, but in the Old Testament, God actually calls religious people whores. Religion might preach grace, but another thing they practice, tend to ridicule God's people, they did it to John the Baptist. They can't fix their problems, and so they just mask it, not realizing religion's like spraying perfume on a casket. See, the problem with religion is it never gets to the core. It's just behavior modification, like a long list of chores. Like, let's dress up the outside, make it look nice and neat. But it's funny, that's what they used to do to mummies while the corpse rots underneath. Now I ain't judging, I'm just saying, quit putting on a fake look. Because there's a problem if people only know that you're a Christian by your Facebook. I mean, in every other aspect of life, you know that logic's unworthy. It's like saying you play for the Lakers just because you bought a jersey. See, this was me too, but no one seemed to be on to me. Acting like a church kid while addicted to pornography. See, on Sunday I'd go to church, but Saturday getting faded, acting if I was simply created to just have sex and get wasted. See, I spent my whole life building this facade of neatness, but now that I know Jesus, I boast in my weakness. Because if grace is water, then the church should be an ocean. It's not a museum for good people, it's a hospital for the broken, which means I don't have to hide my failure, I don't have to hide my sin. Because it doesn't depend on me, it depends on Him. See, because when I was God's enemy, and certainly not a fan, he looked down and said, I want that man. Which is why Jesus hated religion, and for it he called them fools. Don't you see so much better than just following some rules? Now let me clarify. I love the church, I love the Bible, and yes, I believe in sin. But if Jesus came to your church, would they actually let him in? See, remember he was called a glutton and a drunkard by religious men. But the Son of God never supports self-righteousness, not now, not then. Now back to the point, one thing is vital to mention, how Jesus and religion are on opposite spectrums. See, one's the work of God, but one's a man-made invention. See, one is the cure, but the other's the infection. See, because religion says do, Jesus says done. Religion says slave, Jesus says son. Religion puts you in bondage, while Jesus sets you free. Religion makes you blind, but Jesus makes you see. And that's why religion and Jesus are two different clans. Religion is man searching for God. Christianity is God searching for man, which is why salvation is freely mine and forgiveness is my own. Not based on my merits, but Jesus' obedience alone. Because he took the crown of thorns and the blood dripped down his face. He took what we all deserve. I guess that's why you call it grace. And while being murdered, he yelled, Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. Because when he was dangling on that cross, he was thinking of you. And he absorbed all your sin and he buried it in the tomb, which is why I'm kneeling at the cross saying, come on, there's room. So for religion, no, I hate it. In fact, I literally resent it. Because when Jesus said, it is finished, I believe he meant it. You know what I find very interesting is that in the world we live in today, many people are, are running from religion. Well, when I was growing up, religion was the thing that people ran to because we would run into problems. But it seems today that people don't want to have anything to do with religion and, and, and possibly because there is a difference when it comes to religion and Jesus. Religion, it's it's defined as man's attempt to get to God, while relationship is God's attempt to come to man. And God did that through Jesus Christ. You see, God didn't want to spend eternity without you and I, so he brought himself to this earth so that we could develop a relationship with him. And how did he do that? He did that through his one and only son, Jesus Christ. So because Jesus died for our sins, we now have a way back to God because now we're declared righteous in his eyes. See, Jesus and religion is something that people are wondering about today, and maybe you're wondering about that. Well, in this series, Jesus and, Pastor Ben Urbanozo is gonna be speaking to us today about Jesus and religion, and how does that affect our lives today? 
So would you welcome up with me Ben Urbanozo as he comes and shares with us this morning. Let's welcome him up. Thank you, Pastor Sheldon. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to New Hope Church. And as Pastor Sheldon just shared today, we're going to talk about a controversial subject, religion. The reason why I say controversial is because, believe it or not, even when Jesus walked this earth, religion was controversial. And we see it in today's world. So we're going to kick it off by, by figuring out what is religion? What does religion mean? What, what is it defined as? Well, religion is defined as an organized system of beliefs, ceremonies, and rules used to worship a god or a group of gods or deity. And, the, and so when we talk about religion today, though, what we're actually talking about is in the Old Testament, God gave Moses the Ten Commandments, as well as some other laws and decrees and statutes. And this would eventually become known as the Law of Moses. And here's the thing, though. God gave his people the Law of Moses to actually stay connected to him. But what happened was when man, when, when Moses gave the law to the people, what happened was they started slowly but surely changing it so it would become like the religions of other nations and other gods. And, by the, and that would continue to happen all the way until Jesus is born and makes his way onto the scene. See, that's what religion is. And I love it because in Matthew 5, 17, it says it like this. Do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have not come to abolish them but to fulfill them. In other words, Jesus was telling people that, listen, yes, I know that you have the law. Yes, I know that you have the, the Ten Commandments, the statutes that, that God gave Moses. But listen, I'm here to fulfill all of it. Because right now what's happening is you're letting religion stop you from having a relationship with God the Father. That's what was happening. And in fact, when you read in the Gospels, we see how Jesus viewed religion. And you see, the problem is, religion is where many people get stuck. They'd rather know the Bible rather than the one it's speaking about. They'd rather follow the commandments and law rather than the one who's given it. You see, religion isn't supposed to be the answer. Religion is supposed to help point us to the answer. And so when Jesus comes onto the scene and he starts his ministry, he realizes that, pe that religion is keeping people away from receiving the life that God the Father has for them. And he witnesses those who say they know all about God, which we know, which we call the Pharisees. And they, start, they, they act in such a way that it contradicts the heart of God. He sees how religion is causing separation and division amongst people. And when I mean amongst people, I don't just mean between God and people, but also people general. That religion will cause division even amongst each other. And the truth is that's still happening today. Well, in John 8, if you have your Bibles, you can turn to John 8. If you don't have your Bibles, don't worry, we're going to go through it on the screens but in John 8, Jesus encounters a situation concerning religion. And here the religious leaders bring to his attention a problem, and they expect Jesus to uphold the religious standards and laws. But instead, Jesus affirms his perspective on what religion is and how he differs from it. And if you have your Bibles, you can follow along. If not, it will be on the screens and you can follow along there. And it starts with verses one, verse 1. Jesus went to the Mount of Olives. At dawn, he appeared again in the temple courts where all the people gathered around him, and he sat down to teach them. The teachers of the law and the Pharisees brought in a woman caught in adultery. They made her stand before the group and said to Jesus, Teacher, this woman was caught in the act of adultery. In the law, Moses commanded us to stone such women. Now, what do you say? See, they were, bent, they were using this question as a trap in order to have a basis for accusing him. But Jesus bent down and started to run on the ground with his finger. When they kept on questioning him, he straightened up and said to them, let any one of you 
who is without sin, be the first to throw a stone at her. Again, he stooped down and wrote on the ground. At this, those who heard began to go away at one, one at a time, the older ones first, until Jesus was left with the woman still standing there. Jesus straightened up and asked her, woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? No one, sir, she said. Then neither do I condemn you, Jesus declared. Go now and leave your life of sin. When, Je- when Jesus spoke again to the people, he said, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. You see, some people believe in religion, but Jesus wants us to believe in him. See, the, the story, this is also known as the story of the adulterous woman. And in this story, it paints a picture of Jesus and religion. See, religion is focused on self-righteousness. Jesus is righteousness. Religion wants to impact, but Jesus brings transformation. Religion tries to look good, but Jesus is good. Religion tries its best, but Jesus is the best. Religion tries to remove Jesus from the equation, but Jesus says, I'm the answer. And so this morning, we're going to discover three biblical principles that lead us to, tru- to the truth about Jesus and religion. Because in John 14, 6, it says this, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one can come to the Father except through me. And so the first principle we're going to talk about this morning is this. Inward is always greater than outward. Inward is always greater than outward. 1 Samuel 16, 7. But the Lord said to Samuel, do not consider his appearance or his height, for I have rejected him. The Lord does not look at the things people look at. People look at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. Now, being a youth pastor, I am blessed every week to work with a bunch of teenagers. I I am blessed, I promise. And so, uh, one of the things I like to do with our teens, especially on high school nights, is play basketball. So a lot of times there's a bunch of guys and even girls and we'll play basketball and we'll play for like maybe an hour. And then we call everybody in and there's something I noticed though about teenagers, especially our teenage guys. When they sweat, they stink. <laughs> and so I remember this one time, uh, it was a couple of years ago, I remember this one time, we, I just, uh, we just had got done playing basketball and we, we, were, like, they, we were all sweating. We were, I was sweating, they were sweating, they had puddles, you know, like on their... On their chest, and so I walk into the youth wing, and I'm ready, and I see them, well, actually, before I walk into the youth wing, I see them do this. Out of their backpack, they pull out this Axe um, body spray, okay? And so they're supposed to do this with it. That's all. No, this guy, this brother right here is going like that, like drenching his body in that body spray. And so I'm going up, I go up to shake his hand, oh, what's up? And before I can shake his hand, the wall of Axe body spray collides with me. Like, I'm like, oh, poof. <coughs> like, I'm asthmatic, man. Jeez. And, and, and he's like, I'm like, brah, dude, you're supposed to go, tch, tch, tch. he's like, yeah, but I smell. I was like, yeah, that's why God created soap and water. Take a shower. Because, sorry, but Axe is not going to do what a shower can. A shower is going to make you clean. The body spray is only going to mask the smell until eventually it disappears, and now you're going to smell like B.O. and that scent, which is even ho- more horrific than any of those. And you see, here's the thing. Religion can't do what Jesus can. Because Jesus washes us clean. Jesus makes us clean. Religion just tries to mask it. I remember one time uh, my cousin, uh, he was into construction, and so he would go to houses, and once in a while he would ask me to tag along. I don't know why, because I didn't do anything, because I don't do manual labor. So I would just watch him. And so I remember one time we were unloading the truck, and we, st- we, we get to this house, and we're unloading the truck, and I look at this house, and this house is beautiful. Like, I'm like, 
like, man, this house is so nice. Like, I'm jealous. And I'm like, man, this house is so nice. Like, why are we even here? This house probably from the outside alone looked like it could probably sell close to a million dollars if it was on if it was uh, on sale right now, at least close to a million dollars, probably way more than that. And my cousin told me this thing, and it was a principle I never forgot after. And I know some of us, we've heard of it, but he's like, you cannot judge it from the outside. And I was like, what do you mean? He's like, because think about it. If it's really nice, what are we doing here? Why are we unloading all this wood? I said, what do you... I guess that make, I guess I guess that kind of makes sense. And so he opens the door, and we go through, and I understood immediately as soon as I stepped foot what he was talking about, because the inside of the house was completely termite eaten. And he was like, "That's the see see the inside, all destroyed. The outside looks nice, but you don't live on the outside." You live on the inside. You see, that's what religion does. Religion tries to paint a beautiful picture even when our inside is rotten. Even when inside we're wrecked. Jesus came to fix the inside. Jesus came so that he can change us from the inside out. That's the difference between inward and outward. Just like how you guys saw in the video, I can put on an NBA jersey. It doesn't make me an NBA player. Trust me, I tried. Don't lie. I know some of you guys are true. You know, you put on a jersey, you think you Michael Jordan, and then you you make you make an air ball. (laughs) You try to dunk, and then you realize you cannot dunk on a 10-foot rim, let alone a six-foot rim. See, it, it doesn't work that way. See, it doesn't matter if on the outside we look like a Christian. That's not what Jesus is focused on. Jesus is focused on, on the inside. Are you following me? Because just like the analogy of that jersey, if I put on a jersey, but I don't have the heart and talent, guess what that makes me? It makes me a fan. It makes me a fan. The Pharisees were fans of God, not followers of God. And the thing is, Jesus wants us to be authentic fans. I mean, authentic followers, not pretend fans like the Pharisees were. You see, Jesus speaks to the heart, not to the appearance. And if you look back at the the story of the adulterous woman in verse 7, it says this, let any one of you who is without sin be the first to throw a stone at her. Because if all we focus on is our outward appearance and we have no substance inside, then Jesus calls us a word that we'll definitely not like, and that is hypocrite. In fact, Matthew 23 says it like this. He's addressing a a whole bunch of Pharisees, and this is what he says to them. In verses 25 to 28, he says, What sorrow awaits you, teachers of religious law, and you Pharisees, hypocrites, for you are so careful to clean the outside of the cup and the dish, but inside you are filthy, full of greed and self-indulgence. You blind Pharisee, first wash the inside of the cup and the dish, and then the outside will become clean too. What sorrow awaits you, teachers of religious law, and you Pharisees, hypocrites. For you are like, you are like whitewashed tombs, beautiful on the outside, but filled on the inside with dead people's bones and all sorts of impurity. Outwardly, you look like righteous people, but inwardly, your hearts are filled with hypocrisy and lawlessness. You see, Jesus' attitude towards the Pharisees is the same that he has towards religion, and that's be real. Be real. He addresses the need that if we're not being real and authentic, then nothing else matters. Be real. Mark 2, 17 says it like this. On hearing this, Jesus said to them, It is not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners. You see, Jesus would rather have us come to him with all our junk, with all our sickness, with all our pain, rather than to try to play it off all cool. You see, Jesus would rather have it where we be honest with ourselves and say, man, I am a mess up, I screwed up, I I got all this junk in me, so I'm going to go to you, Jesus, rather than say, I don't need Jesus because I look okay. See, a couple couple of months ago, I think it was like a little bit over a month, I was playing basketball uh, with my friend guys, 
And so for some weird reason, I had the ball and I'm running down court, which is interesting because I'm a big guy. And normally big guys don't do the fast break. We do the slow break. And so I'm running down, I'm running down the court and my friend is defending me. And so at first I'm like, dude, why are you defending me? Let me go. I'm, I'm big. Let me go. I need this. This is for my stats. But he's chasing me. He's defending me. And me being me, I trip over my own feet. And so I fall down, but I didn't just fall down. I fell down, and I don't know how it happened. It's because it's me. I elbowed myself in my rib and landed on it. And I was in excruciating pain. The game stopped. We were just playing pickup basketball. So the game stopped, and I'm lying on the floor in the gym. I'm like, oh, this is sore. But I I, I like basketball. (laughs) I like keep, to keep playing. And something in me was going, Ben, you're hurt. No, 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 it's okay. So I got up, and, and everybody took a break. We took a water break, and, and I'm kind of like trying to massage it, you know, trying to be like, okay, it's all right. I, you know, I just, I'd never had that pain since I was, I haven't had that pain since I was a freshman in high school when my friends decided to body slam me. Yeah, I don't even know why that happened. Just, that's, that's the only time that I felt that pain. And so I remember feeling that pain, and so, uh, everybody's asking, are you okay, Ben? Are you all right? And I'm like, yeah. Yeah, I was like, oh, you can keep playing? I should have said no. Like, I was in that much pain where I know my brain was telling me, no, you need to say no. But my, my heart was saying, no, 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 play. So we, get, we kept playing. And here I am, now we're playing, and, and I'm like this, running on the court. <laughs> like, I'm, I'm, I'm in so much pain, I can't even play. But, but some, the competitive in me said, okay, you know what? You're going to go all out. So I, tr- I did my best to forget about the pain, and I just played and played and played until I went home. So Katie, my wife, uh, I got into the car, and, and she looked at me. She's like, you okay? I go, yeah, I'm all right. She's like, well, you are. No, no, I'm fine. I'm good. I'm good. Let's go get something to eat. So we go get something to eat. We go home, and I'm there sitting down, and I'm eating my chicken nugget, and this is what I'm doing. They go, ER, no, I'm okay, I'm all right, just let me eat this chicken nugget. <laughs> and, then I'm, and then she keeps asking me, do you want to go to ER? And I'm like, no, I'm okay. And so finally I go, I go shower and get ready, and, and, and that's when it hits me. Ben, you're hurt. As much as you try and spin it, you're hurt. You might have a broken rib, a fractured rib, maybe it's just a rib contusion, but you're not going to find out unless you go to the doctor. And you can decide. You can, either be, you can either wait for the pain to get worse or you can go now. And so quickly, I, so I get out of the, I get ready and I look at Katie and Katie looks at me and she has that twinkle in her eye because she knows what's about to happen because she asked me, here they go, you are. Yeah, yeah, we go. And thank the Lord we went. And thank the Lord Katie only told me I told you so once. But thank the Lord that you know, there's nothing broken. They just said it was a rib contusion. But you see, the thing is, if I had just been focused on, no, 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 I'm okay, I'm okay, I'm okay, and wasn't real, I would have never heard the doctor tell me I'm okay. Instead, what would have happened is I would have just kept staying in the pain and thought maybe it's something worse. See, Jesus came so that we would be healed. Not so that we'd look good, but that we'd be healed. Jesus is far more focused on what's happening in us than what's happening outside of us. He wants to focus on our heart. He wants to look inside. And you see, that's what I I love the most is that Jesus calls attention to us, to our very core. Religion deals with surface, but Jesus points to the most inward parts of our heart and soul. Religion would be fine if we just were to stay in the shallow and swim there, but Jesus calls us to the depths of his ocean. Some of us heard this story before. It's a well-known story, but I think it fits in with where, how Jesus sees religion being uh, more focused on the outward than the inward. There was, a, there was a young man who was in high school, and, and he was excited. It was Friday. It was going to be a weekend. And not only was it going to be a weekend, but there was going to be a long break. And so he's there, and he's watching, and he sees one of his classmates who's at, who's at his uh, locker. 
And this classmate of his, he's seen him around, but he, he never really had a smile on his face. He was the kind of kid that always got picked on. He was really smart, but he got teased for being smart. Well, this kid sees that kid, uh, the smart kid, at his locker, and he opens his locker, and, and he sees him start to take out his textbooks. And boy, were there a lot. And the kid is thinking to himself, wait a minute, there's, there's no homework. I'm in his class. There's no homework. Why is he taking all his textbooks home? And he sees that all his classmates kind of come, and they pick on him, and, and they walk past, and, and that's it. Well, as this kid is carrying all his textbooks, some of them fall out of place, fall on the ground. And so the kid who's observing it sees, hey, you know, everybody's kind of just walking past him as this kid is trying to pick up his books, pick up his stuff. You know, I'm going to go help him. And so he walks to the kid, bends down, picks up, his, picks up the books, and starts talking stories with him. After talking stories with him, he finds out that the kid was going to go home, and where the kid lives is kind of close to where he lives. And so he's like, hey, you know what? I'll just walk with you. I'll walk you through home, bro, because I, I live, like, just a couple, down, a couple houses down the road. And so they make their way down, they're cruising, and they're, and they're talking stories, and, and they're laughing, they're telling jokes, and, and this kid who's never, he's never seen smile, starts to smile and laugh. Well, finally, they get to the house, and, and the kid looks at the other kid and says, hey, this is where you live? And he's like, yeah, this is where I live. And like, hey, hey, you know, you, sh- you should call me up tomorrow. We can go cruising, we can go beach, you know, we can do whatever. Yeah, we can, we can go hang out. And the kid's like, oh, okay, Sure. And so from that moment, a, a friendship is born, and, and they become the best of friends, and, and, and then it becomes their graduation day. And that smart kid is not a valedictorian. And as, as, as all valedictorians have to do, they have to give a speech. And so the, he, goes up to the, he goes up to the podium, and he says, um, I just want to share one story. And it's a moment that changed my life forever. See, one day... Things were really bad at home. My parents were fighting. I was getting picked on. I wasn't feeling love. I wasn't feeling anything. It felt like nobody even knew I existed. And so I had made a plan. My plan was I was going to take my own life. I was going to take my own life. I figured nobody would even care. But I didn't want my mom to have to come down to the school and clean out my locker. So I chose to take my textbooks and all my stuff out so that way she wouldn't have to come to the school afterwards. Well, as the Lord would, would show it, that my books would fall on the ground and everybody walked past me. Kids were still teasing me as they walked past. But then this one kid came and he picked up my books. And not only that, but he started talking stories with me. And I'd seen him in class. I knew who he was, but, but he started talking with me. In fact, he said, I'll walk with you, I'll walk with you home, bro, because I live right next to you. And, and we became the best of friends. And he looks at his classmate, who's in tears. And he looks at him and says, you probably didn't realize this, but you just saved, you saved my life that day. You showed me that, that I do matter. Even if it's just to one person, I matter. You see, religion sees past us. It walks past us. Jesus always walks to us. He doesn't see the outward appearance. He sees the inward. While religion will just keep walking by, Jesus walks straight to you. And that's the second principle. The second principle is that relationship is greater than rules and routines. Relationship is greater than rules and routines. John 15, 5 says it, Yes, I am the vine, you are the branches. Those who remain in me and I in them will produce much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. Now, for those of you who are married, I'm pretty sure we could all agree on this. I think it's, what's more important? Is it more important that your spouse wake wake you up, cook you breakfast, uh, says have a great day at work, you come home, there's dinner on the table, uh, every, uh, dish, dishes are, are washed and all this and that. You go, home, you go to sleep and she says, okay, good night. Or he says, good night, love you. Is that more important than you waking up with your spouse, your spouse cooking breakfast and sitting with you, talking about what your day looks like? 
before you leave to work or when you leave to go somewhere, they give you a big hug and a big kiss on your cheek saying, have a great day. When you come home, dinner is not only, dinner's not only on the table, but they're there waiting for you because they want to enjoy the meal together. And not only that, but then you go and watch a movie together. And you laugh, you cry, you cheer. And then as you go to sleep, you look into each other's eyes and you say, good night, honey, I love you. And they repeat the same thing. I'm pretty sure if we're married, we'd want the second one more than the first. Why? Because the first is like the routines of being married. And I don't know about you, but for me and my wife Katie, I would not like the routines of being married. I'd rather have the relationship. It's the same thing with Legos. I don't know, you guys, ever, you guys see Legos today? Like, it's super expensive, right? Like, $20 for like five pieces. But you know, like in today's, in today's world, right, they have all these really awesome Lego pieces. You can build like the Death Star and all these things. And it's only because I, th- I look at it and I'm like, okay, that's, that's great. But in order to build that, you got you to gotta have all these rules of, okay, this piece has to go here, this piece has to go here. And it takes forever and a day. I liked it when I was a kid and you just got like a whole box full of just regular Legos and you just build whatever you like build. Because I could enjoy that. I would enjoy that. I would build it and I'd make stuff and, and be like, oh, it's an airplane. Looks nothing like an airplane, but it's an airplane in my mind. But here's what I'm trying to get at is this. Have you ever seen those videos of those people who actually build the Death Star thing? And then somebody knocks the table and it falls down and it breaks into pieces. Do you see their reaction? It's like someone died in the family. No! I always laugh because I'm like, guys, that's just Legos. You see, you see, religion hypes up the rules and routines and makes it look good. But let me tell you, if it breaks, there's nothing left. See, relationship is far greater than the rules and routines because relationship bears fruit. Relationship builds, bears fruit. See, when it comes to religion, we can often be reminded of our shortfalls. We'll often be reminded of our sins and mistakes, leaving us to believe that we're not worthy of anything. See, I love basketball. I love playing basketball. I love playing pickup basketball, which means you just grab a ball, you find a court, and you just play it. I love playing basketball, and when we play basketball with me and my friends, I love it because we have fun. But then you put us in a league, and everything changes. Why? Because there's rules. There's regulations. And so what happens is, I've actually done this. I've, we, me and my friends, we play uh, pick up basketball, and then one time, I remember, they actually asked me, hey, you want to play on the church league? And so I said, okay, sure, I'll play church league. I love basketball. You know what I learned at the church league? I'm horrible at basketball. I'm horrible. I'll stay in the paint for th- more than three seconds. I, uh, when, when we play, what, they, what I wouldn't call foul, they call a foul. And what I learned is, man, when, I, when it comes to regular league, regular basketball, I am horrific. Like, I straight up am junk. But when I play pickup basketball, it's relational. Like, like Pastor Sheldon will knock the glasses off my face and then we'll laugh. In church league, it's like, or even in any basketball when there's a rule, it's like, oh, that's a foul. Everybody goes crazy. You see, there's something different between a relationship and rules and routines. Because when it comes to religion, we don't measure up. We will always fail. Because religion says, try, 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 try. And Jesus says, be. Because even when you and I are imperfect, he still wants us. When you look back at the adulterous woman, John 8, 9 says this, At this, those who heard began to go away one at a time, the older ones first, until Jesus was left with the woman still standing there. You see, Jesus doesn't leave us. He stays because he wants a relationship with us. You see, Jesus isn't concerned about the rules and routines like religion is. He is more concerned about having a relationship with you and I. Come, follow me. Those are the three words that Jesus speaks to invite people to follow him and have a relationship with him. Not based on what they were doing right or what they were doing wrong. 
I mean, think about it. He was calling fishermen, tax collectors, and straight-up sinful people. Why? Because he wants a relationship with every single person. Because when we have a relationship with Jesus, we're invited to receive the life that God wants for us. 1 John 5, 11 and 12. And this is the testimony. God has given us eternal life, and this, is, and this life is in his Son. Whoever has the Son has life. Whoever does not have the Son of God does not have life. Can you circle, can you circle the word Son? Because listen, this is what the Bible says. This life is in his Son. Whoever has the Son has life. Whoever does not have the Son of God does not have life. It doesn't say whoever has religion has life. It doesn't say if you don't have religion, you don't have life. It says if you have the Son, you have life. If you don't, you don't. Because it's a relationship with Jesus. A relationship with Jesus gives me the freedom to experience the fullness of God's grace, forgiveness, and love. And that's something that religion can't do. Religion affects the way we see God because it makes God look like our boss and we're the employee. And man, as an employee, I better listen to my boss because if I don't listen to my boss, he's going to fire me. And not only that, but he's going to throw me literally into the fire. Right? But when we, when we have a relationship with Jesus, it changes how we see God because we see God as our Father in heaven. And then we see that he calls us his sons, his daughters, his children, whom he loves. You see, I think there's a big misconception when it comes to Jesus and religion. Religion tells us that we have to go to church, that we have to read the Bible, that we have to pray, and that we have to do good things. Religion is all about I have to. And if not careful, religion can become a false god. That's right. Believe it or not, there are many people that they don't even realize that their religion has become a God before God. And that's what will happen. We'll put rules and routines before a relationship with God. Because religion, and when that happens, religion builds a wall that separates us from having a relationship with Jesus. And when there's that separation, we miss out on who Jesus, Jesus really is. Uh, a lot of times when I, would grow, when I was a kid, people would ask me, well, what religion are you? And I had honestly no idea what to tell them because I was baptized Catholic. I was raised by a Mormon mom who sent me to Christian after-school programs. So I would always tell them, uh, I'm one, either one of these three, I don't know, or all of them. But when I remember when I, when I came to this church as a teen and the one the one phrase I always heard was this, other than church is not a place you go to, church is who you are, is that it's not about a religion, it's about a relationship, that Jesus doesn't care about your religion, he cares about your relationship with you. And so I remember uh, being, I think I just graduated and I gave my life to Jesus, I said, I want that relationship, because I have no idea what it means to have a religion. I, I, had, I had three growing up, actually four, because there was a moment in my life where I was like, there is no God. And so I remember uh, making that decision to receive Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior. And, and I tell you right now, I understood that, hey, now I have Jesus. I have a relationship. I have a friendship with Jesus. He is with me now. And he never leaves me. That's what his, that's what his word says. And if, the word, if his word is true, which it is, then that means he never, ever leaves us. Well, I remember this one time, uh, my, my stepdad, who's Catholic, uh, he, he came to me and, and I was... I was uh, I was in our living room, and he comes to me, and he says, here, here, Ben, this is for you. And so he gives me a necklace, and on that necklace is this piece of paper with the image of Jesus. And I'm like, okay, well, what is this for? And he's like, well, it's because, you know, you, you just keep you safe, because I know you go driving, you go to work, you do this, you go to the church, and all this. So it's, for, it's to keep you safe. And I looked at him, and, and, and I didn't mean no offense, or, or uh, I didn't mean to sound weird or insult him, but my, my honest reaction was, but it's paper. And he's like, no, no, but it's the image of God. But I, and I told him, but, but it's, it's printed on paper. And I looked at him and I told him, I, I thank you very much for the, for the heart behind it, but 
can I, just, can I just share this with you? I made a decision to have a relationship with Jesus. And my heart my honestly believes this, that if I get into a car accident, this piece of paper is not going to save me. But my relationship with Jesus will. Because it's my relationship with Jesus that determines where I end up. And so I told him, thank you very much, but I don't need it because I have Jesus. And so he said, okay, he took it. And, and I looked at it and I was like, I, I don't have to have an image of Jesus. I have the real thing. I don't have a religion. I have a relationship. I can call my friends up because I have a relationship. I can call Jesus up because I have a relationship with him. Not something that looks like it. See, that's the difference between relationship and rules and routines. Because here's the truth. Religion cannot give us eternal life. Religion can't give us that. Only Jesus can. And you know when we develop a relationship with him, we'll discover that we'll follow his ways and him because he loves us. And that's the third principle. That love is greater than fear. Love is greater than fear. 1 John 4.18 says it like this. There is no fear in love, but perfect love drives out fear because fear has to do with punishment. The one who fears is not made perfect in love. When there is love, there can be no fear. Uh, I love the month of October because that means that there are stores filled with certain things that I enjoy which is masks. And being a dad of three little girls, I have fun with that. And so we'll go to Target, we'll go to Walmart, and I'll put on masks, and I will truthfully try to scare my girls. I'll be chasing them in Target. And in fact, recently, I think I put a, there was a lion mask. And it wasn't a, it wasn't a like, a really gory mask. It was just a lion. And so my, my middle daughter, Brianne, she looks at me, and I go, oh, baby, look. And she's like, uh-uh. Uh-uh, I don't, uh-uh. And so I put it on, because, you know, you know, right, as parents, when you say, uh-uh, you got to do it. <laughs> Sorry, I'm going to teach you not to fear anything. So I, so I put on the lion's mask, and I'm chasing her in Target. Like, for real. Like, in the Halloween section, I'm going to go, Rawr, like, you know, roar, and, and all this and that. And, and, and she's like, no, daddy, no, no. And she goes to mommy, she goes to Katie, and she hugs her, and I'm like, and I start laughing. And she's like, stop. And so I take off the mask, and instantly, as soon as I take the mask off, she's like, daddy? Daddy! And she hugs me. So I do what any other parent, what any dad would do. I put the mask back on. <laughs> ah, ah. But, but here's the thing. <laughs> One, I'm, I'm still learning what it means to be a good dad. <laughs> but a second, uh, the reason why I did that is because I wanted her to see, you have nothing to fear. Because dad will always be here. Dad is far greater than any monster you're going to face. You have nothing to fear when your dad's here. And you know what? That's true about us. See, religion tells us that we have to fear, but, but God shows us that he loves us. We have nothing to fear. And when the Bible says to fear the Lord, it means to, ha- that actually really means to have an unsubstantial Love for him. That you realize that he is God. And you love him because of that. See, I think sometimes religion puts on a mask and makes, tries to make us scared, but the reality is God loves us. Jesus loves us. When it comes to religion, it tends to utilize fear to get people to do things, which means that their hearts aren't into it. They're just doing the tasks so, they don't, so that they don't suffer which makes them focus on the outwards rather than the inwards. Religion utilizes fear to remind us that we're not good enough, that if we don't want to go to hell, we better do what is right. And you know, this interesting thing is religion always tends to use those words like hell and blasphemy to instill fear into people. In fact, often religion will use hell as a scare tactic and punishment to try and lead people into obeying the rules and commands. See, I remember when I was a kid, whenever I do stuff, there would people be around me and say, oh, you're going to go to hell. 
Like, like smallest thing. Like, if I told a little lie, oh, you're going to go to hell. Oh, you never listen to your parents? You're going to hell. And I would hear that all over. Oh, you're going to go to hell. You're going to go to hell. You're going to go to hell. And all of a sudden, I thought to myself, man, there's a lot of people that's going to be joining me in hell. Because, <laughs> man, if this is where we're all going, if this is because of what I'm doing, I'm going to go to hell, then, man, everybody's going to be there. But you see, this is where we've got to realize. Hell was never created for us. Hell was never created for us. It, hell was created for Satan and his minions after they, were, after they uh, rebelled against God. Hell was never created for us. But a lot of times religion will, sh- will share with us that that's where we're going to go, right? Oh, you're not, oh, you living this lifestyle, you're going to hell. Oh, you're doing this, you're going to hell. You know what's interesting is that Jesus doesn't use fear to intimidate people. Jesus never once used fear to scare people. Why? Because his love, he used his love to encourage people, to encourage change. See, the punishment that we do deserve for our sins were placed on the cross because of how much Jesus loved us. In Jesus, there is no fear or condemnation. In fact, go back to the adulterous woman, John 8. Verse 10 and 11, Jesus straightened up and asked her, woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? No one, sir, she said. Then neither do I condemn you, Jesus declared. Go now and leave your life of sin. Ephesians 2, 3 to 5 says it like this. All of us also lived among them at one time, gratifying the cravings of our flesh and following its desires and thoughts. Like the rest, we were by nature deserving of wrath. But because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive when Christ, with Christ, even when we were dead in our transgressions. It is by grace you have been saved. <clears throat> There's something about the story about the adulterous woman that I always, uh, I think we all can re- relate to. But there was one point, part of the story that I, I forgot until just this past week. I mean, think about it. Here's the story, right? Jesus is speaking to a bunch of people in the temple. The religious leaders come and they bring this woman who's caught sinning and say to Jesus, Jesus, this woman is caught in, a, in the act of adultery. You know what the law says. You know what, you know what is supposed to happen. What do you say? And they're asking him so that way they can trap him to show him that, hey, you're not really the son of God because you're being disobedient. And I love it because they ask Jesus, and what does Jesus say, do? He, in other translations, it says that he sits down. Like, can you imagine all these religious leaders come and then Jesus just sits down in front of them and starts writing in, in the dirt? And there they are. They're probably mad at this moment. They're like, Jesus, we brought this woman who was caught in the act of adultery. What do you say? You know the law. You know what's supposed to happen. And Jesus stands up and looks at them and says, okay, well, whoever doesn't have any sin in them, you guys can be the first one to throw the stone. And right there, the Holy Spirit just convicts them. Because they're dealing with Jesus. Jesus doesn't deal with the outward. He deals with the inward. And one by one, they, they drop their stones. And they leave. Until it's finally just Jesus and the woman. And Jesus asks her, well, woman, where's your your accuser? Where are those that were supposed to condemn you? And her reply is, there are none. The truth of the matter is this. There was actually one person who could have been there. There was one there without sin who could have thrown the stone. It was Jesus. And when Jesus and that woman is standing there and he asks her, where is your condemners? To be completely honest, that woman should have been scared out of her mind. Because the only one, the only one that could have had the ability to lift up that stone and be correct in that scripture was there. She should have been scared out of her mind. Talk about fear. She should have been fearful. Why wasn't she? Because love is greater than fear. Look at how Jesus answers her. Then neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. Leave your life of sin. See, love is how we're supposed to be towards each other. Not throwing religion, not throwing fear at people so they get scared. Jesus never did that for us. 
he's saying, listen, my love is far greater than the fear of hell. My love is far greater than any fear you have to have. My love is far greater than anybody picking up a stone and you being afraid that they're going to throw it at you. That's my love. That's who I am. See, I remember when I first came to church, I remember I first, uh, I went to the youth ministry first, and then I remember there was this one time I had to step foot into the sanctuary, and I honestly thought that either two things was going to happen. Either the building was going to catch on fire, or I was going to catch on fire. Because I was like, I am not, I, I know I've done wrong. I know I've done bad things. I, I, I know I'm a sinner. But thank the Lord, the building is still here, and I'm not burnt. See, the Bible says that God is love. And that's what religion forgets. That we weren't created to secretly hide in fear when we fall short. But that we were made to love and be loved by God. John 10.10 shares that Jesus came so that we would have eternal life and have it abundantly. Religion will always focus on hell and eternal death. But Jesus will always focus on bringing life to those he loves. Why? Because fear creates lifeless religion. Fear creates Christians who only want God so that they can escape hell. And let me tell you, heaven is not a place for people who are scared of hell. Heaven is a place for people who love and are loved by God. You see, Jesus and religion is still a controversial subject. Even, when, even as it was 2,000 years ago when Jesus roamed the earth. And while religion r- focuses on the outward appearance, Jesus focuses on the inward. He calls us to swim out to the deep rather than stay in the shallow. Jesus values relationships over the rules and routines of religion. Because it's not about how much we try, but instead what Jesus has done for us. And lastly, while fear is associate, often associated with religion, Jesus pursues us with his love because his love leads to life. When it comes to the differences between Jesus and religion, the simple truth is this, that Jesus is greater than religion because religion is all about me. It focuses on what I do or what I did and how I can be right with God. And if that's all it was all about, if, if that's all it was about, if it, was, if it was all about us being right, us what we do, did I do it right? Did I do it, do it wrong? If that's what it all came down to, then the truth is we wouldn't need Jesus. But the truth is also, if that's what it all came down to, what I did right or what I did wrong, then you and I would still have to pay for our sins. That you and I would still have to give because of our sins. That we would have to give our lives. But as we all know, that's not what happened. What happened was, and we find it in John 3.16, for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. Can you do me a favor? On your bulletin, circle believes in him and make it big. Because that's what the world has to remember. That's what we have to remember. It's all about believing in him, not a religion. It's It's not about that. When we believe in him, we receive not just eternal life, but we also see that we're loved. See, religion focuses on me. But when it comes to the end of me, that's when I'll experience Jesus. Because when religion ends, that's when we see who Jesus truly is. Take a look. He is more than you could ever need. He's more than the eye could see. I don't deserve his love, but he's always been there for me. You see, Jesus met me when I was at my lowest. And if you don't know Jesus, know this. 
He is the greatest example of generosity this world of greed has ever seen. And when Jesus hit the scene, he changed the scenery and met diversity with serenity. If you're looking for peace, he offers plenty. Jesus was and Jesus will forever be king. And when the angels sing, they sing of the grace that was displayed for sinners like me. I can't explain him and I can't describe him. And if I could, he wouldn't be Jesus because you can't explain eternity and you can't comprehend the galaxies. But it was the loving hands of Jesus who spun them into existence and created man knowing he would go to the cross to pay our sentence. There was a certificate of judgment with a period after the sentence, and we were sentenced to death long before he said it is finished. He is a father to the orphan, a shelter for the homeless, a hiding place for the abused, and an anchor for our storms. He stormed the gates of hell and came out on top, and the power of his gospel cannot be stopped, even when the world tries. And they try a lot. He traded places with Barabbas and became the catalyst of missions across the world covering every portion of the atlas. If you're in need of rest, I know of a mattress. If you don't know Jesus, your future is tragic, but he gladly embraced tragedy so we could live in his presence of majesty. His presence is presence, and it's his presence that presents preciousness to a world of peasants. He is far from pretentious, but still loves those who are. He is the light of the world and hung the stars. He brings the dead to life and delivers life to the dead. He took a crown of thorns on his head so we could put crowns at his feet, and I I can't wait until I get to kiss his feet that were nailed to a cross for me and for you and for every person around the world. He loves the world and I love his word because the word became flesh and in his flesh he demonstrated the word to the world. He is an example to every boy and every girl. He is a lover of black people. He is a lover of white people. He is a lover of the unchurched and the assembly under the steeple. He doesn't see the believers' failures but still takes time to celebrate their faithfulness. It's the power of the spirit that enables us and gives us boldness when the world labels us. And if you want to label me, please call me a Jesus freak. If that freaks you out, good. Because it's better to be good with God than to fight being misunderstood by a world that could never understand. So let it be understood that I don't worship man. We worship Jesus. And although he doesn't need us, he still sees us and pleads with us to run to the cross where he bled for us. His heart bleeds for us. His heart grieves for us. But still graciously grants us a pardon for our treason in a season where the world tries to explain the way to work of the spirit with human reasoning. There is a reason they can't. Because the spirit is like the wind and the wind cannot be seen. But loved is the one who believes without seeing the unseen. I'm telling you today that Jesus is something. He's something more. He's something great. And if you want to know him, you don't have to wait. He stands at the narrow path with a key to the gate, and you only have to reach out and embrace his grace. I don't care who's president. I have a king who is always present. I don't care who holds musical celebrity. The voice of the Lord will always be the sweetest melody. I don't care who owns the riches of the globe. My Jesus holds more wealth than one ruby on his robe. I don't care who is the strongest or the fastest. Nothing matches the creator of the universe and his immortal, infinite status. I don't care about religious leaders who died and stayed dead. I'll only worship the one who conquered death and wears a crown on his head. His name is Jesus, and I'm telling you, he's something. He was faithful yesterday, and he is faithful today. I can feel his presence whenever I pray. And when the time comes for me to fade away, I'll remember the day I heard him say, My name is Jesus. See, when we see who Jesus is, we see beyond religion. Because religion doesn't fit where Jesus does. See, religion says to conform to the outside, conform on the outside, but tra Jesus transforms us on the inside. Religion gives us a list to follow, but Jesus says, come follow me. Religion points to death, but Jesus came so that we could have life. The religion says to fit in. But Jesus, well, he says to stand out. Because Jesus is greater than religion. And maybe you're here today, and maybe you've been burnt by religion. Maybe you followed all the rules and regulations, the routines, and all that religious leaders told you that you must follow, otherwise bad things are going to happen. Maybe you're focused on trying to look the part, all while inside your heart and soul is wrecked. 
Maybe you settle for the rules and routines rather than experience a relationship with Jesus. Or maybe the fear of religion has stopped you in its tracks. Fear that stones are going to be thrown your way because of what you've done and who they say you are. And that's why we have to come back to Jesus. See, Jesus isn't waiting for your life to get in order. He's not waiting for your life to look nice or pretty enough so that you can come to him. See, he wants a relationship with you right now. He wants to cut through the surface and get to the deep. And whether you're a Buddhist or a Mormon, an atheist, a single parent, divorced, alcoholic, struggling with pornography, homosexual, or whatever your nationality is, or whatever other reason you may think you have, or other reasons that people have said to you that you can't have a relationship with Jesus, that's wrong. Because Jesus wants a relationship with you. And in that relationship, he wants you to experience the amazing love that he has for you. Because Jesus is greater than religion. Amen? Would you bow your heads with me as we pray? There may be some of us here today and, and maybe we've been burnt, burned out, or just straight up confused about religion. So let's settle it. Let's have some clarity. Religion isn't for us. Jesus is. And right now, in this very moment of your life, wherever you may be, whether life is good, whether life is bad, whether if you're, you're full of sin or you think that you're not full of sin, doesn't matter what religion you think you believe in. Jesus wants a relationship with you and he wants you to believe in him so that you would have eternal life but more than that that you would experience the fullness of him he wants that with you right now there might be some of you you saying I, I don't know how to I don't know if I can how do I have a relationship with God how do I, how do I draw closer to him and and it all starts with one choice. It's accepting Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. And maybe that's where you're at right now. And so with everybody's eyes closed and heads wide, I'm going to ask that. I'm going to say a prayer. And I'm going to ask that you would repeat it. And, and although you're going to repeat it, you're not following a routine. You're not following a rule. What you're saying is, Lord, I want a relationship with you. This is me talking to you. This is me conversing with you, not just saying words. But I want to connect with you. I want a relationship with you. So Lord Jesus, I receive you as my Lord and Savior. I believe you died on the cross and that you rose again to give me eternal life through a relationship with you. Help me to grow closer to you every moment of my life because you love me no matter where I am. Thank you that I don't have to follow rules but that I get to follow you for the rest of my life. In Jesus' name. Can I ask, if you said that prayer for the first time, I want to pray for you. And so if you said that prayer for the first time, would you be able to raise your hand and say, that, I just said that prayer for the first time. I accepted Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior because I want a relationship with him. That I, no longer want, I don't want a religion, but I want a real relationship with him. Go ahead, see your hand. See your hand back there. Lord, you see their hands, but most of all, Lord, you see their heart. And I pray, Lord, that you would bless them, that you would allow them to grow closer to you, to grow deeper with you, Lord, because now they have a relationship with you because they believe in you as their Lord and Savior. And Lord, for the rest of us that, Lord, we believe in you, help us, Lord, to not let religion stand in the way of separating us from you. 
that, Lord, you will always be the answer for our lives. And so, Lord, I pray that you just bless us, continue to move and grow in our lives. Thank you, Lord, that you are greater than everything else. In Jesus' name, and everybody said, amen, amen. Would you congratulate those who made that decision this morning?